she popped up somewhere new. Olive was standing in a big room, surrounded by huge skeletons. A cake? These are very impressive. Olive saw a little old man dusting one of the skeletons. Hello, I'm Olive. Oh, hello. My name's Terry Dactyl. It's a pleasure to meet you. Nice to meet you too. What is this amazing place, Terry? Well, Olive, this is a museum, and these are dinosaur skeletons. Dinosaurs used to roam our planet millions of years ago. Where? That's a long time. Oh, yes, and it's my job to keep these spotless. I could really use some help tonight dusting them. I'd love to help you, Terry. Thanks, Olive. We have to be very careful, though. They're extremely delicate. So Olive and Terry got to work dusting the bones. But all of a sudden, Olive spotted a shadow moving. It looked like one of the dinosaur skeletons. Egg! The skeleton's alive! Olive turned and ran away, but she wasn't looking where she was going. Olive, watch out! Cried Terry, too late! Yeah! Olive ran straight into another skeleton and all the bones collapsed. Those bones tumbled into the next skeleton and it fell over too. Then the next and the next until every skeleton had tumbled into a huge pile of bones on the floor. Oops, sorry, said Olive. Olive, what have you done? The museum opens soon and everybody will want to see the dinosaurs. Sorry, I saw a dinosaur move over there and it scared me. Standing next to the pile of bones stood a rather sheepish looking boy wearing a dinosaur mask. Oh, that's my son, Jerry Dactyl. What have I told you about creeping up on people wearing that mask? I'm sorry, Olive. No wonder you were scared. I'm sorry too, said Jerry. That's okay, Jerry. But how am I ever going to put all these skeletons back together? It's impossible. Would you like to see my dinosaur drawings, Olive? Look, I've done every single skeleton in the museum. These are really good. Drawings? Piles of bones? I think I may have an idea. Jerry, we can use your pictures to help us rebuild all the skeletons. I'm sure we'll be finished before the museum opens. Great idea, Olive. Let's do it. So they got started. But it was like a huge puzzle. It really wasn't easy to work out where the bones were meant to go. Something's not quite right, said Olive. Too late. The museum has just opened. Here comes the first tour group. And um, here on your right is the Tyrannosaurus Rex. And uh, uh, as you can see, it had absolutely huge wings. Oh! oh. And over here is the Brontosaurus with its uh, uh, two tails. Oh. Ah! Uh, that's enough of the dinosaurs. Let's move on, shall we? Phew, I think we got away with it, Olive. I think we've created some brand new dinosaurs, like the Tyrannosaurus Rex. <laughs> <laughs> they all laughed, and as they did, Olive realised it was time to go. Typical Olive, daydreaming again, said her mum. OK, actually, I've been rebuilding dinosaur skeletons. Your head's been in the sand too long, dear, said Olive's dad. Her little brother laughed. <laughs> but Olive wasn't listening. She was already dreaming of her next big adventure. She popped up somewhere new. Olive was standing in the middle of a huge circus ring. She was wearing big shoes, a silly wig and a large red nose, just like the one worn by a clown in a poster she could see nearby. Oh, eh, I'm at the circus. Suddenly, someone shouted. Oh, look out. A cheeky little monkey wearing a red hat swung past, snatching her red clown's nose from her beak. Hey, come back. You'll never catch him. He stole my red nose, too. Said a very sad-looking seal, dressed in a clown costume. I've been trying to get him a red nose back all day, but he's just too quick. Oh, I'm Olive, and you were on that poster. I am the great Grimaldi, the funniest clown in town. Or at least I was. I don't feel very funny now. Not without my red nose. Olive was sad to see Grimaldi so downhearted. 
I'll get your red nose back for you. Then you can be the funniest clown in town again. It's not a possible that a cheeky monkey is always out of reach. <laughs> Olive looked up at the monkey sitting on a trapeze, high up in the roof of the circus tent. He was wearing a red nose. Then she saw the circus cannon nearby. A cheeky monkey too high to reach. A circus cannon? I think I may have an idea. You can get him a red nose back? Grimaldi asked. Yes, wish me luck. Suddenly, the cannon went boom! Wow! Shooting Olive up into the air like a rocket. Okay, red nose, here I come. Olive was ready to snatch the red nose back, but as she flew over, the monkey ducked, sending Olive shooting over his head and bouncing off the sides of the circus tent. Luckily for Olive, Grimaldi swung into view on another trapeze and caught hold of her just in time, much to the now-watching audience's delight. Oh, thanks, Grimaldi. Olive looked down and saw the red-nosed monkey balanced on a high wire below them. OK, one red nose coming up. Olive let go and dropped down onto the high wire, catapulting the surprised monkey back up towards Grimaldi. Who caught him by his feet? Gotcha! cried Grimaldi. Suddenly, the monkey threw the red nose up towards Grimaldi. Hey, catch! called the monkey. Grimaldi caught the red nose, but he had to let go of the monkey's feet, and the monkey dropped down onto the high wire, sending Olive catapulting. I have it! Olive looked down. Eh, uh, but who has us? They tumbled towards the circus ring below. Luckily, they landed in a safety net. Who are they laughing at? They're laughing at you, Grimaldi. You don't need a red nose to be funny. You're Grimaldi, the funniest clown in town. You're right. Just then, Olive heard something falling from above. She looked up and... Plunk! The monkey had dropped her red nose and it landed right back on Olive's beak. Bravo, Olive. You make a great a clown. Well, I do like a bit of clowning around. They both laughed, and as they did, <laughs> Olive realised <laughs> it was time to go. Oh, typical Olive daydreaming again, said her mum. Pekek, actually, I've been clowning around in the circus. Your head's been in the sand too long, dear, said Olive's dad. Her little brother laughed. <laughs> but Olive wasn't listening. She was already dreaming of her next big adventure. She popped up somewhere new. Olive was standing in a little village. The buildings were made entirely out of logs and they nestled between tall green trees and snow-topped mountains. She was wearing a lovely woolly scarf. What gig? What a beautiful place. Just then, Olive heard a strange gurgling sound coming from behind one of the log cabins. So she went to investigate. She found a little girl sobbing into her hanky in a most peculiar way. Olive had never heard anything like it. My name's Olive. Are you OK? Oh, oh, I didn't see you there. My name's Heidi High. My family own the holiday camp here, and today we're holding our famous Swiss family yodeling concert to mark the first day of the ski season. Oh, big! How exciting! Oh, you don't understand. There isn't any snow. Tradition says if we don't have any snow on the first day of the ski season, we won't have any snow at all, and no skiers will come to visit. In the distance, Olive could see the beautiful snow-capped mountains, but in the village there was only the tiniest dusting of snow on the rooftops. She was about to start thinking of a way to help when she heard an announcement boom out over the loudspeakers. Heidi hi, Heidi hi, time for our last yodel loading rehearsal. That's my mum, I'd better go and practice. Olive followed Heidi back to her family to find out what yodeling was. Then the hills erupted with sound as Heidi's family all burst into a strange song. Olive stood and listened. It was then she noticed that the dusting of snow on the rooftops had begun to quiver and shake. As Heidi and her mother hit a high note, the snow rolled off the roof and landed on the ground. Olive grinned. Yodelers? Loudspeakers and a snow-capped mountain. I think I may have an idea. 
Heidi, help me collect all the loudspeakers. We're going to create a super speaker. Olive placed them in a long line, pointing towards the snowiest peak. Now all you need to do is yodel into here, and I'm sure your voices will shake the snow down from the mountains in no time. Yodel, yodel, do you really think that'll work? Asked Heidi. There's only one way to find out. And with that, they burst into song. In the distance, the snow on the mountain tops began to quiver. It looked like it was dancing as it gently started to roll down the slopes towards the village. But even though they yodeled with all their might, the snow stopped short. Yodeloodle will have to join in, Olive. We're just not loud enough. <coughs> said Olive as she cleared her throat and prepared to sing. They yodeled and yodeled and the gathering crowds watched with delight as the snow tripped and danced its way gently into the village, covering the entire place with a thick blanket of snow. Oh, Olive, there's enough snow here to ski and sledge and build snowmen until springtime. Thank you. Dick, it was no problem. They all laughed. And as they did, <laughs> Olive realised it was time to go. Oh, typical Olive daydreaming again, said her mum. Actually, I've been yodelling in the Swiss Alps. Your head's been in the sand too long, dear, said Olive's dad. Her little brother laughed. <laughs> but Olive wasn't listening. She was already dreaming of her next big adventure. Until she popped up somewhere new. It was a place covered in soft yellow sand and it was next to a glistening blue sea. It's a lovely sandy beach. Olive looked down and saw she was wearing flippers. She tried to walk but fell flat on her beak. <laughs> Don't worry, little ostrich! Boomed a loud voice. I'll save you! A strong-looking horse helped Olive up. He had the shiniest mane of hair and the brightest smile she had ever seen. He wore a red jacket and spoke into a megaphone. Hi, I'm David Hoppyhoof, beach lifeguard. Hey, your loud voice is making me ears ring. You'll get used to it. I'm always here, so if anybody gets into any trouble on this beach, I will rescue them. Where? You're a real hero. Just doing my job. Boom, David, as he proudly combed his shiny hair. <laughs> Just then, Olive heard a cry coming from the sea. Two tigers were in trouble. Their claws had punctured their rubber dinghy. Hail, we're thinking. David, those tigers need your help. But David had disappeared. Olive couldn't see him anywhere. <laughs> then she noticed a very funny-looking <laughs> sandcastle. Olive shook her head. Why are you pretending to be a sandcastle, David? Those tigers need you to rescue them. I can't. But that's your job. You're the beach lifeguard. I was only pretending. I've always wanted to be a lifeguard, so I borrowed this outfit. The truth is, I never rescued anyone. David started to cry. <laughs> you see, I hate the water. It makes my hair go all frizzy. Help, we're still sinking. Olive spotted David's huge comb and a surfboard lying nearby. Oh, cool. A surfboard? I think I may have an idea. David and Olive grabbed the surfboard and using David's comb as a paddle, they paddled out and rescued the tigers. Hooray, you're our heroes. They paddled back to the beach. David didn't get a drop of water on his shiny hair until... There you go, my tiger friends. Back safely on dry land. As David lifted the tigers onto the beach, he started to wobble. Oh, 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 oh. And then he toppled back What's into the sea? Oh, hair. your hair looks different! exclaimed Olive. I love it! It's so big and it's so bouncy. It's really beach chic! Excuse me, came a stern voice. It belonged to an even bigger horse. It really did look like a lifeguard. My name is Big Jim and I am the lifeguard of this beach. What are you doing with my megaphone? I'm sorry, I only borrowed it so I could pretend to be a lifeguard like you. Big Jim smiled. <laughs> I think you should keep it. 
After seeing you bravely rescue those tigers, I think you would make a great assistant lifeguard. Why, thank you. Bean David, he was thrilled. He couldn't believe his dream had finally come true. And now you've got the perfect beach haircut as well, said Olive. They all laughed, <laughs> and as they did, Olive realised it was time to go. Oh, typical Olive, daydreaming again, said her mum. Back? Actually, I've been helping Hoppy Hoof the lifeguard. Your head's been in the sand too long, dear, said Olive's dad. Her little brother laughed. <laughs> but Olive wasn't listening. She was already dreaming of her next big adventure. Until she popped up somewhere new. Olive was wearing a sparkly purple tutu and white boots with metal blades on the bottom. She was standing on a white floor in a big ooh, chilly room. Olive took a step forward, but slipped on the floor. It was made out of ice. Wow. She fell over and landed on her bottom. Ouch! Ooh, this floor's very slippery and brrr, very cold. A very glamorous ice skater glided up to Olive and helped her to her feet. Oh, thanks for helping me up. My name's Olive. The ice skater was wearing a sparkly white outfit and a cape made of hundreds of purple ribbons. He was looking rather upset. Hello, Olive. My name is Sammy Sparkle, and I'm having a dazzling disaster. Why is that, Sammy? It's the biggest ice skating competition of the year, Shimmer and Shine, and my partner is nowhere to be seen. Without a partner, I can't enter the competition, and it begins in one hour. Maybe I can help you, but can you show me what to do? So Sammy took her wing and tried to teach Olive how to ice skate. But Olive slipped, wobbled and flopped all over the place. Well, I'm not sure ostriches are cut out for ice skating. Oh, but Olive, how are we ever going to win Shimmer and Shine? Just then, Olive noticed Sammy's cape. Hmm, the ribbons from your cape? I think I may have an idea. They went backstage to Sammy's dressing room and got to work. Olive plucked the ribbons from his cape and tied them all together. Oh, what are you doing to my cape? I've made a long ribbon to tie us together. Now I'll be able to stay on my feet while we dance. Oh, what a fabulous idea. Suddenly, a voice boomed out over the loudspeakers. Will the final two competing ice skaters please come to the ring? Olive quickly wrapped the ribbon around them, tied a knot and off they went. They glided out onto the ice and began to dance together. Because Olive was tied to Sammy, they both performed an amazing dance and Olive didn't fall over. It was all going so well until the knot in the long purple ribbon began to loosen and Olive slid away from Sammy. Oh no, Olive, what are we going to do now? Grab onto one end of the ribbon and I'll hold the other. Whatever you do, Sammy, don't let go. But it was too late. Olive was slipping and sliding all over the place, running on the spot, skating backwards, forwards, here, there and everywhere. It was a disaster. Sammy tried to pull Olive back towards him, but as he did, she tripped and the ribbon snapped into lots of little ribbons which flew up in the air along with Olive! Screamed Olive with her wings flapping in the air. She flew straight into Sammy's sparkle and they both dramatically dropped to the floor. The crowd stood to their feet and went wild! Sammy Sparkle couldn't believe it! The crowd loved us, Olive. Olive and Sammy bowed to the judges as they each held up their scorecards. Ten! 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 Oh, ten! Fabulous! <laughs> A perfect score. We've won Shimmer and Shine, and it's all down to you, Olive. Oh, phew! For a moment there, I thought we were skating on thin ice. <laughs> <laughs> they both laughed, and as they did, Olive realised it was time to go. Typical Olive, daydreaming again, said her mum. Actually, I won a skating competition. Your head's been in the sand too long, dear, said Olive's dad. Her little brother laughed. <laughs> but Olive wasn't listening. She was already dreaming of her next big adventure. Until she popped up somewhere new. A group of people were running round a ring. Each of them had a dog trotting at their side. Suddenly, a voice from a loudspeaker boomed. Welcome to 
Dr. Mott's Dog Show. Oh, I love a good dog show. Exclaimed Olive. Just then, she heard a sad voice. Oh, dear, what have I done? The sad voice belonged to a little old lady who was holding a small carrying case. I'm Olive. Is there something wrong? Oh, hello, dear. I'm Mrs Moggins, but I should be called Mrs Sillikins because I've come to the wrong show and my little Buffy here won't be able to take part. Why ever not? Because Buffy is a... a a cat! Mrs Moggins whipped open the door to the animal carrier and a small, whiskery creature peered at Olive. A cat? Oh, that could be a problem. She's so disappointed not to be in the show. Look how droopy her whiskers are. Why don't I get a nice cup of tea to cheer you up? Oh, yes, I'd love a cup of tea. Olive got two cups of tea and a plate of mini sticky bicky mm. bites, which were very sticky indeed. Yay! These mini sticky bicky bites are sticky to my feathers. <laughs> Giggled Olive. If only Buffy could be in the show. Mrs Moggins sighed. Olive looked at the biscuits. Hmm, a cat. Some mini sticky bicky bites. I think I may have an idea. Mrs Moggins, let's make a dog disguise for Buffy using these sticky bickies. With Mrs Moggins' help, Olive laid all the biscuits out on the ground and encouraged Buffy to roll over them. They all stuck to Buffy's fur. Now Buffy is a new type of dog. <laughs> a mini sticky picky. All she has to do is woof and her disguise will be perfect. Olive showed Buffy what to do. Woof! And Buffy copied her. I think you should take her into the ring, Olive. After all, the disguise was your idea. Things went well at first. Buffy trotted along nicely. She rolled over and even gave the judge her paw. Let's have a huge round of applause for Olive the Ostrich and Buffy, said the judge. But just then, one of the dogs started to follow Buffy around the ring. Soon, all the other dogs were following her too. Yay! Cried Olive. I think they've got a whiff of the biscuit. The dogs chased Buffy, and Buffy chased the dogs, and the mini sticky bicky bites started to drop off. The dogs went crazy, woofing and munching the bickies up. Everyone could see Buffy without her disguise. Look, cried the judge. It's a cat. <gasps> Everyone gasped. Meow, <laughs> said Buffy. It's no use, Buffy. We've been found out. Then suddenly the air was filled with Booming laughter. <laughs> it was the judge. <laughs> oh, that's the funniest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> the judge thought it was so funny, he awarded Buffy a special rosette for best cat in a dog costume. Buffy was so happy, she purred. Thank you for all your help, Olive. Buffy is the happiest cat in the show. She's the only cat in the show. <laughs> <laughs> they both laughed. And as they did, Olive realised it was time to go. Oh, typical Olive, daydreaming again, said her mum. Again? Actually, I disguised a cat as a dog and won a rosette. Your head's been in the sand too long, dear, said Olive's dad. Her little brother laughed. <laughs> but Olive wasn't listening. She was already dreaming of her next big adventure. She popped up somewhere new. Olive was standing in the middle of a huge amusement park. People were having a great time everywhere. Okay, lots of fun things to do here. Whoa! Suddenly something zoomed over Olive's head. She looked up to see people riding on a roller coaster. Olive thought it looked very scary. Oh, wow. Wish I could have a go on that. Olive looked down and saw a little hamster. Hello, I'm Olive. I'm Harry. I really want to ride the Mega Scream roller coaster. The Mega Scream? I don't like the sound of that at all. Problem is, I'm not allowed to go on it on my own. Would you like to ride the Mega Scream with me? Olive took another look at the Mega Scream. As she did, the roller coaster cars did a loop the loop. <laughs> Olive gulped. Ooh. The Mega Scream looked really scary to her. Um, it does look like lots of fun, but it's very hot today. We could get him um, sunburned so high up. Maybe we should save it for later when it's cooler. Oh, OK then. Olive could see how disappointed the little hamster was and she wanted to cheer him up. Olive looked around at all the other rides. 
Hmm, an amusement park with lots of fun things to do. I think I may have an idea. Come on, Harry, we're going to have the most fun day ever. Olive decided that she and Harry would try everything in the amusement park, apart from the mega scream, of course. They threw coconuts at the coconut shy. They had a go on the carousel. Oh, this is fun! Said Olive as they went round and round. They slid down the helter-skelter. They even had a go on the dodgem cars. Soon, they had tried pretty much everything in the amusement park, apart from the Mega Screen roller coaster. Can we go on the Mega Screen now? Um, I'm really hungry. Why don't we get some yummy ice creams? Oh, ice cream, my favourite. It was Olive's favourite, too. They went and bought two huge cones. But Olive's ice cream was so big, she couldn't see where she was walking. Olive, shall we try this one last ride over here? Why not? Said Olive, not seeing what the ride was. She and Harry took their seats and suddenly a metal bar came down over them. Eh, uh, what ride is this? It's the Mega Scream. Okay. Here we go. Before Olive could say anything, the roller coaster accelerated away. <laughs> Olive and Harry went zooming and looped the loopings all over the park. Isn't it amazing, Olive? I thought I'd be scared, but now I'm on it. This is the best ride ever. <laughs> Finally, the ride came to the end. Olive and Harry looked down. Their ice creams had disappeared. Oh. They looked behind them to see two foxes covered in ice cream. Oh, uh, sorry. Our ice creams must have flown off the cones somewhere on the ride. <laughs> we rather enjoyed our surprise snack, said one of the foxes. Olive and Harry got off the mega scream. Thanks for giving me such an amazing afternoon. And thank you for helping me get over my fear of roller coasters. <laughs> Chuckled Olive. They both laughed. And as they did, Olive realised it was time to go. Typical Olive, daydreaming again, said her mum. But heck, actually, I rode the Mega Scream roller coaster. Your head's been in the sand too long, dear, said Olive's dad. Her little brother laughed. <laughs> but Olive wasn't listening. She was already dreaming of her next big adventure. <laughs> Till she popped up somewhere new. But heck, this is a spectacular place. Olive saw a man with a huge curly moustache. He wore a red and black tunic with a crown on the front. I'm Olive. Where am I, please? I'm Beefy the Beef Eater. You're on a tour of the Tower of London. He answered. Brick I'm in London. Olive found a camera hanging around her neck and snapped a few pictures. And if you look to your right, you'll see the ravens. Tradition says they must never leave the tower or the kingdom will fall. And not a single one has. Not on my watch, anyhow. Hello. What's your name? Olive asked. Roberta. And why do you look so sad, Roberta? Because I really want to explore London, like those tourists over there. I want to see all the sights, Big Ben, Buckingham Palace, and especially Trafalgar Square. But of course you can't leave the tower, said Olive. No, and Beefy is always watching and counting us. Hmm. So you need to somehow get away without Beefy realising. Olive looked around and saw an ice cream van nearby. She also saw a lady tourist wearing a long black raincoat. An ice cream van? A black raincoat? I think I may have an idea. Please, can I borrow your raincoat? Olive asked the lady, who nodded. Oh. Then she bought an ice cream cone from the ice cream van. Olive ah. put on the black raincoat and stuck the cone onto her own beak, using the ice cream to make it stick. She looked just like a raven. Well, almost. I'll pretend to be you, Roberta, while you go to see the sights of London. Wow, great idea! When Beefy was looking the other way, Roberta made a dash through the tower gates. Olive tried to blend in with the other ravens, but she was so tall she really stuck out. What was worse, the ice cream cone was melting, dripping into a growing puddle at her feet. Beefy walked over and began counting the ravens. One, two, three, four... When he got to Olive, he stopped and raised an eyebrow. Aww. Said Olive. 
That was a pretty good impression of a raven. Beefy shrugged and continued to count. Five, six ravens. Excellent. But now, Olive's ice cream had melted so much, the cone fell off her beak. Hang on a raven counting minute. You're not a raven. You're an ostrich. <coughs> I'd better count again. Oh, no. He's going to realise there's one raven missing. Beefy began to count. One, two, three, four, five. Only five? But just in the nick of time, Roberta came swooping in over the Tower of London's walls. She landed just behind Beefy. Ah! Said Roberta loudly. Beefy spun round. Aha! There's number six all safe and sound. What was I thinking? It's not like these ravens ever leave the tower. Not on my watch, anyway. <laughs> Beefy walked off to get his dinner. No, us ravens never leave the tower. Chuckled Roberta. <laughs> this made Olive and the other ravens laugh too. And as they did, Olive realised it was time to go. Typical Olive, daydreaming again. Said her mum. Okay. Actually, I've been a raven in the Tower of London. Your head's been in the sand too long, dear. Said Olive's dad. Her little brother laughed. <laughs> but Olive wasn't listening. She was already dreaming of her next big adventure. She popped up somewhere new. She could hear some tinkly music. It was coming from a little white van that was parked nearby, and Olive could see all sorts of things inside the van. Oh, burger! Those look tasty! exclaimed Olive. Olive was wearing a white overall and a special paper hat. She could hear strange grunts coming from inside the van. Hello? Are you all right? asked Olive, and she reached in through the window to help. Up popped a very cold lady. Thanks, shivered the lady. I'm Millie Vanilla. I'm Olive. Pleased to meet you. Oh, you're cold. You need to warm up. Oh, no. If I do that, my ice cream will melt and I need it for a birthday party. Ice cream? Yes. It's a very tasty treat and I don't want to boast, but my ice cream is the very best. She reached into the freezer and scooped some ice cream into a corner for Olive to taste. I had a secret ingredient, whispered Millie, and she stuck a stick of chocolate on top. Olive licked the ice cream. Mm. It's very tasty. Like I said, the very best. Now I mustn't be late for the party. Would you like to help me? Oh, yes, please. Olive jumped into the van and they drove off. They were nearly there when Olive heard a bang. The van stopped with such a bump that all the chocolate sticks fell out of the window. Olive and Millie got out to see what was wrong. One of the tyres was completely flat. Big egg. All the airs leaked out. But Millie was more worried about the big brown oh. puddle on the ground. What's worse, all my chocolate sticks have melted in the sun. What am I going to do? At least we still have the ice cream. But how can I get to the party with a hole in my tyre? Olive looked through the ice cream van window and saw the cornets and cherries. Hmm, cornets? Cherries? I think I may have an idea. She bit the end off a cornet and stuck it in the hole in the tyre. Then she scooped up the melted chocolate and poured it in through the hole. When the tyre was full, Olive plugged the hole with a cherry. Oh, good as new. Thanks, Olive. And so, with the tyre fixed, they drove to the party. The children cheered as Olive and Millie handed out ice cream cornets, but the birthday boy looked puzzled. Where's my chocolate stick? He asked. Millie began to sniffle. He only likes ice cream with a chocolate stick stuck in it. Well, never mind. Olive told the boy. This is the very best ice cream. Uh, not without the chocolate stick, it isn't. He noticed the mended tyre. Hey, if I can't have a chocolate stick, can I have that cherry? Oh, not that one! Cried Olive. But before Olive could stop him, the boy pulled the cherry out of the tyre. <laughs> Chocolate sprayed out of the hole, splashing everyone and everything. Oh, no! Said Olive. But then she heard the birthday boy laughing. Hey, this chocolate tastes amazing. In fact, this is the very best chocolate in the world. Surprised, Olive and Millie tasted their ice creams. Yum! Yum! I don't want to boast, but he's right. Boasted Millie. Which makes this the very best ice cream in the world. Every
everyone laughed, and as they did, Olive realised it was time to go. Oh, typical Olive, daydreaming again, said her mum. Forget? Actually, I made the very best ice cream in the world. Your head's been in the sand too long, dear, said Olive's dad. Her little brother laughed. <laughs> but Olive wasn't listening. She was already dreaming of her next big adventure. She popped up somewhere new. Olive oh. saw beautiful plants and flowers everywhere. She was in the jungle. Olive was wearing an explorer's hat and boots. She had a camera and a magnifying glass. Burk, I have everything I need to explore this place. She was about to set off when Ooh. she noticed something odd. Some leaves which seemed to float along above the ground. Olive took out her magnifying glass and looked closer at the Ooh, leaves. Those leaves aren't floating. Tiny ants are carrying them to their anthill. Olive photographed the ants and walked off into the trees. First, she passed a splashing waterfall. Olive took a photo with her camera. Next, she passed an enormous blue flower. She took a photo of that too. Finally, she found herself on a cliff top where she took a photo of the spectacular view. Olive thought she'd stop to take a rest. Suddenly, she heard a little voice. I'm lost. Could you please help me find my way back home? Olive turned and saw a brightly coloured parrot. Well, sure. I'd love to help you. I'm Olive. Well, sure. I'd love to help you. I'm Olive. Olive was confused. No, my name's Olive. What's yours? No, my name's Olive. What's yours? Wait, why are you repeating everything I say? Wait, why are you repeating everything I say? I'm sorry. I should probably be getting on my way. I'm sorry. I should probably be getting on my way. No, please don't go. I really am lost. My name is Anthony the Ant, and I really want to go home. Um, I think you're a parrot, not an ant. Um, I think you're a parrot. OK, that's enough, said Olive. Olive held her magnifying glass up to the parrot's face, and sitting on top of the parrot's head was a tiny little ant. You see, I'm using the parrot to talk for me because my voice is so tiny and quiet. Olive plucked the ant carefully from the parrot's head and the parrot flew away. It's good to meet you, Anthony. Maybe I can help you find your way home. Well, I live in a huge ant hill. Have you seen it? Hmm. You mean like this one? Yes, yes, that's my home. Can you take me there, Olive? Olive wasn't sure she knew which direction to take. But it was then she remembered all the other photos she'd taken while walking all day and could see she had made footprints as she walked. Hmm. A trail of footprints showing where I came from. And lots of photographs. I think I may have an idea. Olive placed Anthony on her shoulder and began walking back, retracing the footprints she'd left. If I look through my photos, I can find your anthill, Anthony. Using the photos, she walked back past the spectacular view, then past the enormous blue flower, and then past the splashing waterfall. Finally, Olive and Anthony arrived back at the anthill. Loads of ants came out to welcome him home. They were so pleased, they picked Olive up and cheered. Hey, I think I might be getting ants in me pants! exclaimed Olive. Olive and the ants all laughed, and as they did, Olive realised it was time to go. Typical Olive, daydreaming again, said her mum. Okay, actually, I helped an ant in the jungle. Your head's been in the sand too long, dear, said Olive's dad. Her little brother laughed. <laughs> but Olive wasn't listening. She was already dreaming of her next big adventure. Till she popped up somewhere new. Olive was in a small, dimly lit room. In front of her were lots of buttons and levers and colourful flashing lights. Where am I? Some lights shone out over a beautiful underwater world outside the window. Bagheg, what a view! There were hundreds and hundreds of fish swimming around in front of an enormous blue canyon. 
Oh, I'm in a submarine deep in the ocean. I can't wait to explore. Olive pushed a big red lever marked forward and the submarine dived deep down into the canyon. Olive spotted the opening to a cave. Hmm, interesting, said Olive as she drove her submarine right into the cave. It's even darker in here than it was before. Olive drove through a big patch of seaweed. Oh no, now I can't see where I'm going. The seaweed suddenly came to life and picked up the submarine. Ow. Then in the headlights loomed the big green face of an octopus. Hello, bubbled the octopus. Okay, who are you? My name's Jonah. I've been trapped inside this whale for days. It's so good to finally meet someone new. My name's Olive. But what do you mean, trapped inside the whale? I just drove into a cave. Oh, no, that was a huge whale's mouth you drove into, Olive. And now he's closed it shut. There's no escape. Okay, that doesn't sound good. We need to make the whale open his mouth again. Maybe I could turn my engines all the way up and then the bubbles will make the whale cough. Then we can escape when he opens his mouth. Olive turned the submarine's engines onto full power and the water started to bubble up. Oh, that didn't work. But then the bubbles Olive had made tickled Jonah on the tummy. <laughs> oh, those bubbles tickle. Hmm, an octopus with eight legs. Tickling? I think I may have an idea. Jonah, if you use all your legs, you can tickle the inside of the whale's stomach and make him laugh. Then we can escape through his mouth. Oh, I think that might just work. He stretched out his eight long arms and began to tickle the whale's tummy. Tickle harder! Tickle harder! Cried Olive. Jonah tickled as fast as he could. A wall of bubbles started rushing down the tunnel towards Olive and Jonah. Watch out! Breaking! What's happening? I think we might be going out of the top. The top? Olive and Jonah were fired out of the whale's blowhole, up high in the sky. Then they started to fall back towards the water. <laughs> Jonah clung to Olive's submarine with his eight tentacles as they fell. His body inflated like a parachute, drifting them both gently down to the surface of the water. Well, that was a lovely gentle landing. Oh, thanks so much, Olive. I'm free at last. That's OK. I think we've all had a whale of a time. <laughs> they both laughed, and as they did, Olive realised it was time to go. Oh, typical Olive daydreaming again, said her mum. OK. Actually, I've been helping an octopus escape a whale. Your head's been in the sand too long, dear, said Olive's dad. Her little brother laughed. <laughs> but Olive wasn't listening. She was already dreaming of her next big adventure. She popped up somewhere new. It was a big room with red carpet, lots of pictures on the walls and a funny-shaped object with three metal legs on display. Oh, hey, this all looks very posh, said Olive. She was in the foyer of a cinema. Olive went up close to look at the funny-shaped object on its metal legs. This is a film camera, said a man as he walked into the foyer. He was wearing a gleaming white suit with black buttons. Oh, hello, I'm Olive. You look very smart. Nice to meet you, Olive. My name is Steve Badenberg. I am the cinema manager. And tonight is the big film premiere of our new blockbuster movie, A Winter Wonderland. Oh, great! I love a good blockbuster. So do I. But I lost the last scene of the movie, and I still need to make all the popcorn. Everyone will be arriving soon. What am I gonna do? Well, why don't I help you? Great idea, Olive. Hey, maybe you could make the popcorn for me. So Mr. Battenberg showed Olive how to make the popcorn. You had to put corn into the machine and turn it on. Well, I should be OK with that. I'll just put the popcorn in here. But she put the entire bag of corn into the popcorn machine in one go. You can never make too much popcorn. Well, I think we're all sorted. 
But what shall we do about the last scene of the movie? Without it, the audience won't know how the film ends. What happens in it, Mr. Battenberg? It's a beautiful winter's day. The snow is fallen from the sky, and the snowman winks to the camera and smiles. Olive looked around the foyer and spied the film camera. Hmm, a film camera? Your white suit with black buttons? I think I may have an idea. Mr. Battenberg, does the film camera work? Yes, I believe it does. To record, you just press the button with the red circle on it. And action! So Olive and Mr. Battenberg began filming. But something wasn't quite right. Oh dear, we still don't have any snow. Suddenly, the popcorn machine started rumbling. Pop, pop, pop! All the popcorn came flying out of the machine into the air. Oh no! said Mr. Battenberg. I think you put too much corn in, Olive. Don't worry. It's just what we need. On camera, it looks exactly like snow. So Mr. Battenberg winked and smiled to the camera and looked just like a snowman on a beautiful snowy winter's day. Oh, Olive, what a great idea. But what about all the popcorn? How are we going to serve it to the customers now? But the customers loved the idea of snowing popcorn and simply caught it in their popcorn buckets. They were all very excited as the film was about to start. The film is better than the real thing, whispered Mr Battenberg. And all down to Olive, the director. That really was a great film, said Olive. Although I had a pretty good idea of how it was going to end. <laughs> They both laughed. And as they did, right. Olive realised it was time to go. Oh, typical Olive daydreaming again, said her mum. Okay, actually, I've been a film director. Your head's been in the sand too long, dear, said Olive's dad. Her little brother laughed. <laughs> but Olive wasn't listening. She was already dreaming of her next big adventure. <laughs>